The Art of Dying Well by St. Robert Bellarmine Chapter 3 The Third Precept, which is concerning the Three Theological Virtues In the last chapter we showed that no one can die a good death without first dying to the world. Now we shall point out what he must do who is dead to the world in order that he may live to God. For in the first chapter we proved that no man can die well without having lived well. The essence of a good life is laid down by St. Paul in his first epistle to Timothy in these words. Now, the end of the commandment is charity from a pure heart and a good conscience and an unfeigned faith. The Apostle was not ignorant of the answer our Lord gave to one who had asked him, What shall I do to possess eternal life? He answered, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. But the Apostle wished to explain in the fewest words the end of the first commandments, the aim of the first commandment, on which the whole law and the understanding of it and its observance and the way to eternal life depend. At the same time he also wished to teach us what are the virtues necessary to attain perfect justice, of which he had spoken in another place. And now there remain faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. First Epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 13. Paul says, therefore, the end of the precepts is charity. That is, the aim of all precepts, the observance of which is necessary for a good life, consists in charity. Thus, he that loves God fulfills all the precepts which relate to the first table of the law, and he that loves his neighbor fulfills all the commands which relate to the second. This truth St. Paul teaches more clearly in his epistle to the Romans. He that loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is comprised in this word, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The love of our neighbor works no evil, Love, therefore, is the fulfilling of the law. Chapter 13, verses 8 and following. From these words we can understand that all the precepts which relate to the worship of God are included in charity. For as the love of one neighbor toward another does not produce evil, so also the love of God cannot produce evil. Wherefore, the fulfilling of the law, both as regards God and our neighbor, is love. But what is the nature of true and perfect charity toward God and our neighbor? The same apostle declares, saying, Charity from a pure heart and a good conscience and in unfeigned faith. In these words, by a good conscience, we understand with St. Augustine in his preface to the 31st Psalm, the virtue of hope, which is one of the three theological virtues. Hope is called a good conscience because it springs from a good conscience, just the same as despair arises from an evil conscience. Hence St. John says, Dearly beloved, if our heart does not reprehend us, we have confidence toward God. First Epistle, Chapter 3, Verse 21 There are 
therefore three virtues in which the perfection of the Christian law consists. Charity from a pure heart, hope from a good conscience, and faith unfeigned. But as charity is first in the order of perfection, so in the order of generation, faith comes first, according to the words of the Apostle. Now there remain faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Let us begin with faith, which is the first of all the virtues that exists in the heart of a justified man. Not without reason does the Apostle add unfeigned to faith. For faith begins justification, provided it be true and sincere, not false or feigned. The faith of heretics does not begin justification, because it is not true, but false. The faith of bad Catholics does not begin justification because it is not sincere but feigned. It is said to be feigned in two ways. When either we do not really believe, but only pretend to believe, or when we indeed believe, but do not live as we believe we ought to do. In both these ways, it seems the words of St. Paul must be understood in his epistle to Titus. They profess that they know God, but in their works they deny Him. Chapter 1, verse 16 Thus also do the Holy Fathers St. Jerome and St. Augustine interpret these words of the Apostle. Now, from this first virtue of a just man, we may easily understand how great must be the multitude of those who do not live well and who therefore die ill. I pass by infidels, pagans, heretics, and atheists who are completely ignorant of the art of dying well. And among Catholics, how many are those who in words profess to know God, but in their works deny Him? who acknowledge the mother of our Lord to be a virgin, and yet do not fear to blaspheme her, who praise prayer and fasting and good alms and other good works, and yet always indulge in the opposite vices. I omit other things that are known to all. Let not those then boast that they possess unfeigned faith, who either do not believe what they pretend to believe, or else do not live as the Catholic Church commands them to do. And therefore they acknowledge by this conduct that they have not yet begun to live well. Nor can they hope to die happily unless, by the grace of God, they learn the art of living well. Another virtue of a just man is hope, or a good conscience, as St. Paul has taught us to call it. This virtue comes from faith, for he cannot hope in God who either does not know the true God or does not believe him to be powerful and merciful, but to excite and strengthen our faith, so that it may be called not merely hope, but even confidence. A good conscience is very necessary. For how can anyone approach God and ask favors from Him when he is conscious of having committed sin and of not having expiated it by true repentance? Who asks a favor from an enemy? Who can expect to be relieved by him whom he knows is incensed against him? Hear what the wise man thinks of the hope of the wicked. The hope of the wicked is as dust, 
which is blown away with the wind, and as a thin froth which is dispersed by the storm, and a smoke that is scattered abroad by the wind, and as the remembrance of a guest of one day that passes by. Wisdom, chapter 5, verse 15. Thus the wise man admonishes the wicked, that their hope is weak, not strong, short, not lasting. They may indeed, while they are alive, entertain some hopes, that some day they will repent and be reconciled to God. But when death overtakes them, unless the Almighty by a special grace move their heart and inspire them with true sorrow, their hope will be changed into despair, and they will exclaim with the rest of the wicked, Therefore we have erred from the way of truth, and the light of justice hath not shined unto us, and the sun of understanding has not risen upon us. Ellipsis. What has pride profited us? Or what advantage has the boasting of riches brought us? All those things are passed away like a shadow. Etc. Wisdom, chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. Thus does the wise man admonish us, that if we wish to live well and die well, we must not dare to remain in sin even for one moment, nor allow ourselves to be deceived by a vain confidence that we have as yet many years to live, and that time will be given to us for repentance. Such a vain confidence has deceived many and will deceive many more, unless they wisely learn, while they have time, the art of dying well. There now remains charity, the third virtue, which is justly called the queen of virtues. With this no one can perish, without it no one can live, either in this life or in the next. But that alone is true charity, which springs from a pure heart. It is from God, as St. John says, and also more clearly St. Paul. The charity of God is poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given to us. Epistle to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 5. Charity is therefore said to come from a pure heart, because it is not enkindled in an impure heart, but in one purified from its errors by faith, according to the words of the Apostle Peter, purifying their hearts by faith. And by divine hope it is also purified from the love and desire of earthly things. For as a fire cannot be kindled in wood that is green or damp, but only in dry wood, so also the fire of charity requires a heart purified from earthly affections and purified from a foolish confidence in its own strength. From this explanation we can understand what is true charity and what false and feigned. For should we delight to speak of God and shed even tears at our prayers. Should we do many good works, give alms, and fast often, but yet allow impure love to remain in our heart, or vainglory, or hatred of our neighbor, or any other of those vices that make our hearts depraved? This is not true and divine charity, but only its shadow. With the greatest reason, then, does St. Paul, when speaking of true and perfect justice, not simply mention faith, hope, and charity, but he adds, Now the end of the commandment is charity from a pure heart and a good conscience and an unfeigned faith. 
This is the true art of living and dying well. If we persevere till death in true and perfect charity. End of chapter 3